Howdy, I'm Dr. Jeff Rouse, and I'm back again on The Best Practices Show. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're watching the trends that are going on in dentistry, one of the hottest topics, if not the hottest topic in all of dentistry is airway. And the question you might be asking yourself as a restorative dentist is this, airway, why can't I get my orthodontist on board? And so today I've got one of the worldwide experts, Dr. Jeff Rouse from Spear Education. You are not going to want to miss this because it's an awesome topic. Love having Jeff on. You're going to see he's a brilliant mind and a super fun guy. So don't miss this. Grab a pen and hit the share button. Now, a couple show notes. We're shooting this live on Facebook like we always do. So if you have a question or if you just want to engage in a little bit of debate, Add your question to the feed, and I'll dish it to Dr. Rouse right away, and we'll get the answers straight from the master while we have them on. Or if you have questions later on, continue to add the questions to the feed because we want you to get the most out of this. Feel free to share the videos. Keep with the shares. We love this. Thank you guys so much for all the shares and suggestions. Up over 39,000 followers on Facebook, and over 150,000 of you have visited us on iTunes, and I can't say anything but thank you. So, And a big part of that is my buddy who's on today, who we've been friends for a long time, and uh, I just always enjoy hanging out with you. I enjoy like hanging out at the bar with you. And I also love being educated by you, Dr. Jeff Rouse. Now, we're going to go into this. And I've had you on many times. I know you are. Hundreds, if not thousands of our viewers know exactly who you are. If you've been to Spear Education or Seattle Study Club Symposium, you know who Rouse is. But if somebody's watching this for the first time, who's Dr. Jeff Rouse and what do you do? <laughs> it's good to be back, Kirk. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Jeff Rouse. Prostodontist in private practice in San Antonio, Texas, and I've been an educator f since 1996, teaching dentists all over the country. And the focus has changed over that period of time. And I took a sort of a special interest in the world of airway back in 2007 when I was doing some research in the office on bruxism. That led me to look at my patients that I've been doing rehabs on and figure out that a lot of those fat old men that had flat teeth and erosion ended up having apnea as well. And the evolution of that finally led me to look at my TMD patients and then the few kids that actually come into the practice and some of the reasons they were coming into the practice, um, including my own son, uh, started me on this journey towards trying to be more preventative in nature and, and get dealing with these airway problems early. I teach that information out at Spear Education, which is where I spend probably half my time now um, visiting with a lot of cool, cool dentists that come out there and talk to us. Yeah, and I'm just going to say this. If you're watching this for the first time, you've never seen this guy speak, you got to see it, him speak. And I tell his story all the time, but I was standing outside of your room. I'm like, that's my buddy. And they're like, I don't care who you are. You're not getting in. It was standing room only. So I was able to sneak in along the wall. And everyone, it was unbelievable how you mesmerized the room and also educated us so well on this. And it's really pushing the envelope, too. You're a great debater, um, great thinker. And today, we're going to be talking about the airway issue in orthodontics. Now, give us a little background on this, like kind of prepare us for why this is such a hot topic. And then the AAO conference and all that kind of stuff. So give us, a, yeah. give us kind of a state of the union on the why of this. You know, it's funny you use the word debater. I think we probably visited about the fact that that's, that was my background. And um, I did radio and I, and I debated as well. And the thing that debate taught me was critical analysis of the literature and how, how bits of information can be woven into a story to present a case that is compelling to whoever is listening. And so it is especially interesting to me when I listen to things like the AAO conference. And, and I have to say, I wasn't at the conference. I was getting, uh, I had my spies there sort of sending me back all the, the details of the conference as it went along. And so I could follow almost, uh, almost as if I was there. Um, 
but it's interesting knowing the literature in the orthodontic world because I tend to read a lot of it. How the 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 perspective changed um, from what I was hoping it would be to I think what eventually came out of it, or at least a lot of it. Um, so the AO was a, an orthodontic conference that um, got together last last week, and the entire focus of the weekend was orthodontics and its point in its um, place with dealing with sleep apnea. And it was an exciting topic. And in fact, at the very beginning, I, I was uh, excited, but almost disappointed in the fact that they use sleep apnea and s- sleep in particular, rather than using the word airway, because I think it's really the management of the breathing all the time. But nonetheless, the, they at least had the topic and, and started talking about it. Um, The unfortunate part was that at least day one of the conference was full of people suggesting it was, say, more of a fad. Um, You know, if your practice isn't going well and you need something to spark the business, maybe that's something you can do is throw airway into the mix. But really that a good a good orthodontic practice, that's not what we do here. We're not going to be treating younger kids. We're not going to be focused on on making, you know, making maxillas go to where they're supposed to do. We're just going to get her teeth in the right place. And so and to hear also from some experts, supposed experts, almost misquoting the literature, um, given that I've had a chance to read it and using the titles and abstracts more than actually the data that's in there um, to try to support their arguments. So. Um, all in all, day one was rather disappointing. There was a refocus that happened in day two, um, and many people were, were happier in day two as far as the supportive nature of or the place orthodontics can play. But um, I don't know if we changed any minds uh, yeah. for orthodontists that went into the weekend uh, already having their mind made up. Right. And let me just start with this. If you're watching this and you're an orthodontist, and you're getting a little fired up right now. You and I were talking about this before. We went. This is not about throwing orthodontists under the bus. It's not about throwing the AAO under the bus. It's not that. It's presenting the natural challenges that are happening with this argument and the literature. And you even said this before we got started. Look, I get it. Like, I've got a friend who does extremely well in ortho. And to change that requires an incredible commitment. Can you speak to kind of like, we're not here to throw orthodontists under the bus or anything like that. We're just presenting what's the state of the union on this and why it might be difficult if you're an orthodontist. And, you know, the, the funny thing, Kirk, is is of, of anybody out there talking about airway or sleep or any of this stuff, there there is no one out there more supportive of orthodontics than I am an orthodontist than I am. In fact, the core of what I teach is this is an anatomic problem and that dentistry has the ability to deal with anatomic problems that medicine cannot, ENT doesn't, no one else does it. The only people that can manage the anatomy that's critical to breathing, mastication, swallowing, all that, the only people that can do it are dentists, and the ones that do it best are orthodontists. Mm-hmm. So I am a huge fan, yet when I go out to lecture, I will either have the biggest fan being my orthodontist in the group, or my biggest critic will be the orthodontist in the group. Right. And, and this, isn't, this isn't all orthodontists, because there's a, there's a good percentage of orthodontists that are like, I can understand this, I can see this, mm-hmm. and then there's others that aren't, right? Right. So the ones that are critical of it, it, it's interesting because the arguments are always the same. And I don't know, honest, honestly, if it's I don't want to change, which is, as I said, I have I got friends that are doing great and I can see why they wouldn't want to change. Why would I change? I mean, my if the ultimate goal is this is a business we need to run an efficient business, we need to make money doing this, then the change that I may institute or ask for can throw off that business until it reorganizes itself. And then it would be, in my opinion, way more profitable because you not only are are getting all the the restorative dentists that are interested in airway issues and you get to do more complex orthodontics for those patients, 
but you get to do a ton of, of younger patients that would have maybe never had orthodontics or for sure wouldn't have had earlier, early phase orthodontic therapy. So, I mean, I, it, it, yes, it's hard, but there is an end that is going to be more profitable, I believe. Um, now, granted, I'm not an orthodontist. I can only speak from the standpoint of when I started doing airway types of things in my practice, it took me a lot of time. It was very difficult to train staff. The communication was hard. The systems were hard. But now, I mean, I have a tremendous amount of business just because I do what I do. I get people from all over the country flying in just because I do what I do. And I get to do dentistry on all those people. And I would have never had another chance to do that. So there is profit to be had in this, a lot of profit, especially when you start making people better because they're going to tell a ton of people about you. They, don't, they rarely tell people about your veneers. Right. Yeah. And another show that we're going to do that we've got slated with you is how to put this team together and how it works within a business. And you're right. I do. That's probably my number one question is, Kirk, how would I even start doing this? And so it's just easier to fall back in the way that you used to do it until it gets easier. But let's go to this. Now, you're talking about the article. And then I want you to speak to the nature of the article and then the airway issue with the four buy and then insurance conversation yeah, you know, that, the, that people are having. The biggest argument, the, the biggest, um, you know, if you had to pick a, a topic that is the one to promote the most angst when you start discussing it between orthodontists, restorative dentists, and maybe uh, oral facial pain people is what happens when four buys come out. So, I mean, even honestly, when I mention it in a lecture, I do it and then I hesitate. If I, if I don't know the group, I kind of pause and I look around and I can see who shifts in their chair. Right. I know that's the orthodontist and I can tell by, you know, how how they react, what their position is going to be immediately because right. it it has been an argument for a long time. And back when I was you know, straight up nathologic prosthodontist, it, the argument was that it caused TMD issues. And now that I look more about the airway, it's that, you know, I don't think the TMD issue was because you, you took a buy out and the occlusion isn't perfect. I think it's because you constricted the arch and made, made it to where they were more sympathetically active. They had more stressful breathing. Right. And eventually the symptoms came home to roost. So, um, the issue, the problem is that a lot of people can tolerate it. It's not a, an all or none. You know, it's just that you don't know who the person is before you begin the process. Mm -hmm. There's no way to look in your waiting room at all the kids you're about to treat as an orthodontist and tell me which of those kids cannot accept the retraction that you're going to do in this particular case. There's no way. Right. And because of that, it would make sense that you would avoid it if at all possible. So mm -hmm. now the, the orthodontists out there, in fact, I can feel them moving right now and twitching at, <laughs> at this moment. What they're going to, the argument will be, there's no evidence to prove what I just said. Okay. So if we look at the evidence in support of taking out bicuspids, there are about seven or eight articles. If you really read the articles, what it says is if the molars move forward after taking out the bicuspids, then it doesn't have an impact on the airway or it can maybe even make the airway larger. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second thing they will say is if you retract the anterior teeth, the, an the, the airway will either stay the same or get smaller. Okay. So here's the biggest problem. We don't know what size airway you need to make you breathe better. So anything that keeps, the, keeps a constricted arch that you're doing ortho on, keeps the airway the same size or makes it smaller, doesn't seem to be working to the advantage of the body and creating a better anatomic situation for a possible problem down the road. Mm -hmm. So, and for sure, if you restrict it, you make it worse. Right. Okay. So how the orthodontist works when the bicuspids come out, what are they doing and, are, and how they manage the space is really important. 
retractive orthodontics like when I was growing up just doesn't make sense. And unfortunately, it tends to still be done quite often, unfortunately. Now, not as much as it was, but it's still being done. Um, the second thing that was interesting is that of all the studies that are out there, when the orthodontists say, you, you know, you're telling me it makes the airway worse and, you know, show me the science, there is no science support in either way that is based on sleep data. It's only based on airway volume. The volume of the airway tells you nothing about how people use the airway. Mm. So, we, you know, you spend an entire weekend at the AAO looking at people. One group stands up and says it makes the airway volume smaller. And the other group stands up and says, no, it doesn't. It either keeps it the same or it makes it bigger. And at the end of the day, it means nothing, absolutely nothing. Because no one knows what the pr appropriate airway volume is. And in fact, there will never be an appropriate airway volume because it's just dependent on he how each person uses it. So what has to happen is they have to create a study where they start looking at airway volume after taking, uh, excuse me, looking at sleep data after taking out four bicuspids. Here's the problem. Got to look at it in people down the road. You can't look at it immediately. You can't, you're not going to immediately create an apneic patient. So you've got to do it retrospectively and start including data that are, you know, based on what's happened down the road, like when they're 40 and 50. So what would be a good, good study? Well, there are a ton of community health studies that are done. Like there's one study, their heart, they do heart health studies. So they go in and they, they get one study, 6,500 people. They do um, sleep studies on all 165. I mean, uh, 6,500 people. They do blood work. They do, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff. And then they monitor them just to see, like they're watching apes in the woods, right? To see which ones die and what bad, you know, what happens. But they've got this baseline to begin with. Well, all they have to do is go in and get, uh, baseline dental records for all those people. They've got sleep studies on them. The kid, the people with four buys out compared to people without four buys out that they actually, and then they, we got, we're getting somewhere. But the bigger, the bigger problem is the people without the four buys out, you got to make sure that their arch is expanded out normally. Cause if they're all constricted, then, then, so they have to have ortho that's done. And it's got to be done well and it's got to be done, you know, so you, you have to start getting that kind of data before you can really say anything. Right. Well, the, orth the orthodontist felt like they had that data. There was a study published a couple years back. Um, actually, it was done here in San Antonio at the, at the ortho department here. And the, the, con the title of the article is there's no link between four bicuspid extractions and sleep apnea. And the conclusion in the abstract basically said that the problem was the study was horrible. And so the interesting thing is that as soon as that study, the abstract was put up on a screen at the AAO and the, the essentially the conclusion was read, read out loud to the audience, every orthodontist that was in favor or, or was anti airway, the Facebook lit up with this picture of that screen. And every one of those that I know I wrote on there, have you ever read the article? To which they said, you know, I haven't gotten quite through it yet. Just basically I read the abstract. And that's the unfortunate thing. Right. The journal, uh, journal allowed them to publish a title and a conclusion that is incredibly misleading. So right. the, art, the article was on um, 5,500 insurance records. So they just go into an insurance company. Right. And that would just bias the study alone, wouldn't it? Um, in some respects or not? No, not really. Not the, really. the bad part about it is they went into an insurance company. They got 5,500 records. And the insurance company handled dental and medical. Mm -hmm. okay? So what they did is they looked for x-rays of people that had four buys removed. And then people that didn't. Now, the people that didn't, they didn't qualify as having ever gone through ortho. We don't know anything about them. So they, their oral condition may be adding to them having apnea. So that's, that's a problem, not a big problem. Here's the biggest problem in the whole thing, and there are many of them. 
but this is the biggest one. The assumption that was made by the author was that if you have medical insurance, you're going to get a diagnosis of apnea if you have it. That's not true. That's not even close to true. Right. The data out there says somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the population is undiagnosed. The first time you're probably going to hear from your physician that you need a sleep study is after your first heart attack. Right. Right. So people are not being diagnosed with having apnea. That's the problem. The conclusion of the article was that 10 percent of people without extractions uh, had no 10 percent of the ones with extraction had apnea. Nine percent of the ones without extractions had apnea. So one percent, not a big difference between the groups. Therefore, there's no significant difference if you had your buys out. Where did that come from? The conclusion should be people with their buys out and people without their buys out are equally underdiagnosed in the population. We just don't know. We don't know anything more than that. That's the only thing the study proved. Right. So it, everyone looks for something to promote or prove what they believe. And unfortunately, at this moment in time, the level of evidence doesn't support the idea that taking out bicuspids is good or bad. So what I argue or what I ask orthodontists when they ask me for the evidence proving that taking out buys makes the airway worse, I ask them for the evidence showing that it doesn't. And that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So common sense says if it's an anatomic issue, the more room you give somebody, the better they're going to breathe for a lifetime. Yeah. And until proven otherwise, I think that's the standard that we ought to go with. All right. Let me ask you two questions. I'm just going to go there because you and I like a little controversy here. And I'm going to ask the question that I have in my head is, OK, let's say I'm a young orthodontist and I'm watching this, Jeff. And I get this. Like, I kind of I understand both sides. What would you say to me about the future? So because I've got three decades in front of me. Do yeah. I just abandon this? Do I wait for airway to get caught up? What? <laughs> I mean, what would you say to a young orthodontist watching this right now? I, I would tell them to do two things, um, three things. One is to um, to put on earmuffs because they're going to hear from some people that they're quacks. You know that they're over treating, and and at some point in time, they have to, in their heart, believe they're doing the right thing. Right. Interestingly, the times when People that are anti-airway become pro-airway is when it affects their own family. Right. So some of the some of the most pro-airway people I know in my own little world are people that were just talking horrible horrible about me and the topic and everything else, and then it affected them, and they came to me and we made them better. Right. And then all of a sudden you have a disciple. Right. So anyone that they they just have to believe it. And when they start getting results, they need to then publicize the results. They need to show they need to put it on Facebook and all the other social media sites to show this is what I'm trying to do. These are the people I'm trying to help. The right. second thing that I would do is that ortho, if you're an orthodontist, you didn't learn how to take care of little kids. See, the AAO is still set on the age of seven is the first orthodontic visit. And you need to get involved earlier than that in these kids' lives because they're more pliable, things are easier to move. And age of four, the, honestly, the, the airway problems that exist, if, they have, if these kids have the problem when they're really young, it's really bad. And so the younger they are with an airway issue, the more you've got to get involved. That's what the data is showing. And so they need to learn to treat younger kids. And that's a management issue, not a technique issue. They have to learn in the office how to handle a four-year-old and what they can and can't do with them and how to, and which is way easier today. You don't have to make impressions anymore. They can digitize all that. I mean, there's, they can, it's just much easier than in the past. Because when I was doing ortho on little kids and they were throwing up on me, that was that was a bad day, right? right. Now they can digitize it. 
The third thing that I would tell a young orthodontist to do is I would do everything in my power to practice with an ENT in my office. Okay, tell us why. Well, because when what they're the people they're seeing are exactly the same people. You see, an ENT, except for procedure one per, one particular type of procedure where they make tongues smaller to fit in normal anatomy. Except for that, an ENT is taking normal anatomy and making it to making it smaller to fit into a small skeleton. Deviated septums isn't because the maxilla and nasal cavity grew out big. It's because everything was constricted. Now, you know, you get hit with a baseball or something. That's a different story. But if the nasal cavity volume is normal, rarely does the septum deviate. Study on an orthodontic study expanded a hundred kids with deviations and all of them either repaired completely or were significantly improved to where they could breathe better. So it's the expansion that gives the room for the septum. So an ENT is trying to fight a skeletal problem when they do that surgery. You and I have talked about the fact that the work coming out of Stanford shows that when that nasal surgery is significantly better if it's accompanied with expansion Mm -hmm. um long soft palates rarely exist genetically it's just a misplaced maxilla and so ent's all the anatomy and anatomic issues that they're seeing and fighting and doing surgery around all those issues are usually skeletal in nature and so the orthodontist and the ent the same they're seeing the same person now the beauty of working in concert is there are some things in an adult patient that you're not going to be able to get to like you, you expand the maxilla. We've talked about Marpy and Sarpy and all the different options. Well, you still are probably going to have to do the deviated septum on the adult. Um, they're going to have allergies. They're going to have. I mean, they're you're going to have big tonsils. You're going to you're going to have things that ENT is going to need to be involved with. So working together now, the ENT can do pieces of the equation. The orthodontist can do a piece. And the patient benefits tr tremendously uh, when those two people are working in together. Um, I'd also, I guess the last thing that I would do is I would urge them to find an oral surgeon and maybe not even one in their own community. And so this is, yeah, this always gets a little sticky. I know. Right. <laughs> right. Um, it, you know, there are guy, there are oral surgeons that are that just do orthognathic surgery still and then there are oral surgeons that do it every so often and I just am dealing I'm just now I've got a friend that is coming to see me that went to the every so often oral surgeon and it's and it's bad it's really bad so I always tell my patients that I want them to at least have two consultations with an oral surgeon if they're making a decision to do any kind of orthognathic procedure. One of those can be of their choosing and it can be somebody local, but the other one is mine. I get to tell them where to go to the other one. And I have four main oral surgeons, none of which are in San Antonio, Texas. Two are aesthetically based and two are apnea based. So if I've got a really fat old man with a ton of apnea, I got two guys that are better at that particular type of move. And I got two that are unbelievable at doing beautiful things that make the airway better as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would find I would be reticent to deal with somebody local if you're not getting the primo premier work because you don't want to have to fight and get bad results with these cases right. you want beautiful people that breathe well feel better and that promote your practice to everyone you don't want to go yeah well i wish you had you know i wish the chin wasn't under the left eyeball you know you want, right you want it just right right now i'm going to ask you this question it's anyone's guess what does orthodontics look like 10 years from now just, or even five years from now so I guess, you know, the interesting thing there is, um, and the question that kept coming up at the AAO was, is this just a fad? Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, 
I'm, I'm invested in this. So I'm going to tell you it isn't a fad. Um, there are, well, let me, I'll, I'll do a real easy calculation for your orthodontist out there. I teach at Spear. We have 10,000 dentists go through the door there every year. We have 20,000 dentists on our online subscription watching our videos. There are a lot of dentists that are starting to believe that some of the problems they see in their practice are airway related. So if you don't want to jump on board, you're going to end up losing those orthodontists. I mean, those, those restorative dentists. And right. they send you not only the airway case, they send you all the, all the easy ones too, the no brainer cases also. Right. So I think there's going to be a pressure for orthodontists to begin doing what we're doing. So our title was, why can't I get my orthodontist on board? My conclusion many times in, in, in teaching this is they don't have to be on board. Some orthodontist needs to be on board. So you don't have, you know, it's just like when restorative dentists would come to Spear and see the beautiful work that, you know, the, the guys out there are producing and what we're showing up on our screen and our treatment planning and stuff. They'll come to me and go, my lab can't do what your lab does. And I'm like, guess what? Time to find another lab. Let me help you do that. And the same answer is going to be true for orthodontists. Now, I'm hoping that what we see in 10 years is that the orthodontic community has started to embrace it more, that we're starting to get the research that we were talking about, that it actually proves what I am pretty darn sure it will prove. Because we're starting to see that from Juan Moon's work out at UCLA, that they're doing sleep follow-ups with expansion on adults, and it's having a dramatic impact. Uh, we know Sarush Saji is doing tongue-tie releases and myofunctional therapy, and it's having a great impact on patients. So I think we're going to start getting the data people are after. I, I would just, if I'm an orthodontist, I hate to be behind the curve. I want to be out in front of the curve. Right. So I hope that I hope that orthodontists are led by the restorative dentist to where they should be in a 10-year period of time. Right. What, what's the other option? The other option is that that it goes the way of Invisalign. And the next thing out of my mouth is if you can't find an orthodontist, go get trained yourself and do it yourself. Right. And just forget the orthodontist. Because if right. I can't, if I, if you're in Wisconsin and you say I'm in such and such a town and my orthodontist didn't on board and I say, go find another one and you go, that's the only one I got. The next thing I'm going to tell them is go become, you know, go get trained. Right. Right. Now I want to speak to that too, because you guys aren't treating this as a fad. You're kind of like doubling down and it's all chips in. And for the benefit of people who haven't heard us talk about this, you shared with me last year, 35 years of treatment planning has been turned on its head. You're not just doing a few courses, 10,000 dentists going through the doors and 20,000 online. You're not treating it as a hot fad. I mean, you're taking the four pillars of diagnosis, adding the fifth, and just speak to that for a second, because this is not, I mean, this is a new lens for you guys. And yeah, so next week, now we've been talking about this for about two and a half years, and right. well, three years, because I, I started working with Frank Spear and Greg Kenzer three years ago. And, um, and we started reevaluating what had been Frank started in, I think, 1983 in teaching facially generated treatment planning. And he said that aesthetics, function, structure, biology are the keys to treatment planning and that you have to walk through that. Basically, show me where you want the teeth to be and then we figure out how to get treatment planning done from there, like setting up a denture. The new pillar, as you put it, is airway. And so now EFSB, aesthetics, function, and structure biology, is now A, EFSB, airway. And airway is evaluated on all of our patients before we begin any treatment planning sequence at all. And so as we're walking through the treatment planning sequence, if we say, well, we could just do this, and yet the airway component of it says, you know, maybe there's a better choice. Maybe instead of just doing this, if you did this, you might be able to actually make them breathe better, feel better down the road. So that's how we're adding it into the equation. And in fact, starting next, well, next Thursday, um, I will be out at Spear and we are, I'm now part of the, the workshop there in teaching treatment planning. So it'll obviously have a big 
airway focus as well now. And I'm in the Warren Dentition Seminar, and that has an airway focus. And um, so I'm a prosthodontist, and so I and I and I you know I've developed treatment planning textbooks and stuff. So that's my true passion. But we throw in airway into the mix now, so it really is cool where we're headed. Yeah, I got three. I was in an office today, and they're going to be out there next next week in your class. So you got to give them a shout out. Now, um, we've talked about orthodontists, talked about oral surgeons. And, and on this hot topic, let's say I'm a restorative dentist watching this, Jeff. Okay, like I love this. I've been going through your courses, and I can't get my orthodontist on board. Give me the advice I need. Like, what would you say to a young or uh, restorative dentist who's like, look, I'm in, but I'm struggling with this. What would yeah. you say to them? You know, the, the, um, too many times I think restorative dentists, um, aren't actively engaged in, in the referral. So too often it's, um, we look at somebody and say, uh, you need to go to the orthodontist and that's where it ends. And I think that the quality of the referral needs to be improved for that young or uh, young restorative dentist. It needs to be, here's why I'm sending you this patient. Here's my, what I see. Here's, and, and really outline, make the case for the airway problems that you're seeing and make the case for what you would like the orthodontist to do. You know, here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'd really like you to do. So what does that mean? It means you kind of got to get an idea of what orthodontists do, right? And that's part of what we teach in the airway workshop is here, here are all the different tools that the orthodontist may have available to them. Let's make sure you're familiar with it. So when you go to them, you've got not only a knowledge of they can do this, but you also have some science behind what advantage it may have for the patient. So I think a better referral than, you know, you need, your daughter needs to go see the orthodontist. I think you, you literally need to write a letter, write an email, have a lunch, have a dinner, have a drink. Um, but you need to, you need to do that with your orthodontist and give them a chance to become a player mm -hmm. with you in this journey. Cause it's fun. If, and it's really fun if it's the orthodontist you like and you've been mm -hmm. using, making mm -hmm. it easy. Yeah. Um, the second is the that once you've had that conversation, if you're not getting anywhere with your orthodontist, you may need another orthodontist. That doesn't mean you have to stop using that person, right? You can still use them. You can use them for the, you know, um, whatever the easy, whatever this the cases that you sent them before but you may have your orthodontist and then your airway orthodontist and for years i had that i had i had a guy that could do amazing stuff on adults and the few kids that i was seeing in my practice i had a guy downstairs so i had you know i had these different spots and everyone does that to be honest with you there's not a not a restorative dentist out there that i bet sends them all to the same people Right. They probably, depending on the part of town people live in, they'll have pockets where they refer to different orthodontists around town. So they have their like one main guy that's around the office where they are. And then they have other people around town. Well, it may be that you start making the case to the parents, hey, this is a little unique. This is more about breathing than about tooth position and function. It's really about health and health's important. So I'm going to suggest to you, you make this drive across town to see this orthodontist. They're really the one that is going to do your daughter the best in this particular case. Right. And then I guess the last one is what I already told you, which is, um, and it's something that I, I am reticent to do, but um, cut out the orthodontist in the equation and go get trained yourself. There are tons of different programs and training on different ways of dealing with young kids. So doing, in fact, the orthodontist will be happy to give you the four-year-old kid. Again, <laughs> right? take them, they're, right? They're, exactly. They're four, five, six. You setting them up for the future. They're going to be okay with you taking that kid. All right. Um, but I mean, if it's, if it's that you can't get your orthodontist to expand until the kid's 12, I heard one the other day, like bring, you know, 
let's wait until they're 12. I was like, why? What are we doing? What am I missing here? And or even let's wait until all these deciduous teeth come out, which could, you know, some people are delayed and it goes down the road. If you're fighting that and you can't get past it, you may just choose to do some, you know, learn how to do that piece of the orthodontic puzzle and learn to do it really well. Um, I don't like saying it, but it but when, if it comes down to I'm in a small town and here's my choice, I can I can not get what I want. Or I can go out and learn how to do it myself. I probably would do it myself because that's what I did for a while. I did my own ortho. Right. Yeah. Now, um, you and I are going to cover so many other topics on this. But when it comes to the debate in orthodontics and airway, any last thoughts on this? This. You know, this? The, my la- my main thought was one that I made earlier, which is um, if you're going to challenge me for evidence saying that I'm right show me evidence that says I'm wrong. Right. And it doesn't exist. In the topic of four by extractions, there is no science out there that shows that it, you know, that these people are better and that they're, you know, they're doing just fine down the road. That doesn't exist. And, you know, canine substitution and, I mean, all the the topics, anything that restricts and constricts the arch form, um, you know, teeth, I had a guy write me the other day, show me where treating a four-year-old is is better than me waiting around till they're 12. And I said, show me it's not. Because mm-hmm. I can show you a ton of evidence that says between four and 12, bad things can happen neurocognitively, systemically, you know, even craniofacially. I can show you that they can continue to get significantly worse between right. four and 12. So show me that it's going to, that not doing it is going to give me a kid that at 12 years old is going to be okay. And they yeah. cannot do it. It will never exist. It's always a risk. And I, maybe that's the dad in me that has a kid with these problems, but I'm not willing to take that chance anymore with right. any, anybody else's kid. And that further compounds with kids between four and 12 with the prescription aspect. I mean, these kids are being written prescriptions at record levels when they can't breathe and they're not sleeping. We just heard of a kid that, you know, fell apart at school and they thought, you know, this kid's just not focusing. Well, they went back and looked at it. The kid was on an iPad, not breathing at night. Well, meanwhile, the mom wants to give him some type of prescription so that he can focus in class. And the bottom line is this isn't an airway airway issue. The kid's just not sleeping. So it all goes back to diagnosis before we decided, uh, you know, and think about how the trajectory of an eight-year-old kid or nine-year-old kid, that that's the diagnosis. And yep. uh, there, there, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of layers to this. And I'm just, as you guys can see, that's why I love this man. I love the dialogue. I love what we're talking about. Now, I got to ask you this because I know we both have to run. Um, if I'm a young dentist and I've been thinking about going to Spear, tell me what Spear is because I've heard about it. I mean, even when I go out and speak, I'm like, you know, they're like, Spear, I've heard about it. Should I go? I'm like, absolutely what do you do have you been living under a rock like what do you teach out there what happens and what are you going to be doing next week well you know so spear is the name itself comes from frank spear and frank spear was a prosthodontist in seattle and was i I think he's one of if not the best dentist i've that i've ever seen ever and so he's not only technically very proficient but he's intellectually very astute and he's the best communicator and teacher that I've ever seen. Um, now Frank taught all of this material for years and years and years, traveled around the country. He was actually traveling like 120 days a year. It was just brutal. And so he started doing it in his office and then eventually expanded it down into Scottsdale where we have an amazing facility. The beauty of doing it in Scottsdale is that his vision was that we need to do when we can't just sit on a stage and talk to people you actually have to do this hands-on you've got to learn to actually set aside the time and do a workshop where you can spend time for three days totally immersed in the topic in order to actually make it a reality and beyond that the idea of workshop it has to be a continuum of workshops you have to and that build upon each one of them so next week i'll be teaching treatment planning Treatment planning is basically figuring out where the teeth belong. And that 
lead you to a course that says, you know what, now you got to get them to work. And that's occlusion. And so all the courses are built on each other. So you're essentially doing my Pross residency in a much nicer way. <laughs> it was much, much nicer than what I had to go through. Uh, you get to be in Scottsdale and we're nice to you. And, <laughs> and yet you learn the same information. So the restorative dentists, I mean, we do hands-on stuff. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing what they've put together out there. And I'm I'm just so lucky to have gotten the opportunity to join them uh, about a year and a half ago. That's awesome. That's awesome. For those of you, there's a link in the post itself, and uh, you can just click on it. It'll take you to the workshops in which um, not only Jeff, but the other amazing instructors out there, I encourage you to check it out. And Jeff, I'm going to have you back for so many other topics on how to put this into play, some other very important components of this. So, buddy, I'm so grateful for our friendship, you just being on it, and heck, I just enjoy hanging out with you. So uh, a lot of fun, buddy. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, man. Good to see you again. Yeah. So stick around. We'll always say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for watching. And I really appreciate it. Thank you for all your suggestions. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see from Jeff and other guests. And I'll line them up and make them happen. Um, and if you enjoyed today, just do us a favor. Hit the share button. Share with your friends. Protect this great profession that we all love so much. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your evening. Mm -hmm.